Sessions. Today we are going to be talking about team building and teamwork at work. I am Jane Hutanum. I'm a business leadership coach. I work with business owners and executives to help them achieve clarity on their goals, I've got the personal and professional growth, uh, and to develop the leadership skills that they need in order to accomplish those goals. And business leaders, whether you are a solopreneur or whether you are working in a big company or you're running your own company, there's always going to be teams that you're working with. There are always going to be, there's going to be teamwork required. There might be formal teams. They might be informal teams. It might be through volunteer work. It might be a sports team you are on, but teams permeate every aspect of our life. You could think of your family as a team, right? Teams are so important in everything we do. And well, last week, uh, Pete talked about enemies and friends and collaboration and how quickly we can decide, and we might decide rightly, we might decide wrongly, but how quickly we can decide whether someone is an enemy or a friend, uh, you know, a friend or a foe for us. He talked about the importance of social connections and how we can build those connections, which can help with teamwork. We're gonna talk more about that today. And so let's think a bit about effective teams. Start with a poll. Oh, did you get my poll, Kelly? I forgot to ask I you. did, I answered it. Is oh. it not there? Oh, is, oh, oh, hang on. There we go, yes. There we go, perfect. Right. Okay. Thinking of the team you spend most of your time with right now, it might be work team, might be volunteer, might be something else. Would you say it's a highly effective team, a somewhat effective team, neither effective nor ineffective. So, you know, some days good, some days not so good. Somewhat ineffective or highly ineffective team. All right. And poll, share results. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. So we have a third said highly effective, just over half said somewhat effective and 11%. Um, so basically one person said a somewhat ineffective. Okay, it's encouraging that the majority of the results are on the effective side. Hopefully by the end of today, everyone will have a few tips and ideas of how they can go back to their teams and work to make them a little bit more effective and move them, move them kind of up the, uh, up that, uh, the, up the scale. That's what it's called. <laughs> All right. So let's just have a bit of an open discussion here. Uh, what makes a team effective? One that you want to be on. Either just take yourself off mute or put your hand up. Jane, I would say good, good communication. Okay. I would say where people are open to like new ideas and new perspectives. Okay. I would Flexible. say, Sorry, oh, go ahead, ahead Fabi. Oh, oh, Ryan, no. go ahead. Allie, go, go. No, 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 no. I'll wait, I'll wait. Oh. People that are polite, <laughs> Allie, you go ahead. I was going to say good teamwork, you know, you're, you're sharing and you're. <laughs> oh, look, Lori ups this and puts her hands off. Hands up. right? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I was going to say, you know, that, in addition to everything that everybody's saying, I would say clear uh, objectives as well. Like they they really know where they're going together kind of thing. The responsibilities, who's doing what. Um, so that would, in my opinion, um, in addition with high communication, like clear communications or. Great, thank you. Okay, Lori. Um, I was gonna say a winning team. <laughs> no, like I not, that they have clear objectives, but they're also meeting the objectives and that they have a balance of objectives. Like a word that I've, a phrase I've heard lately is called total experience. And it means like getting customer experience plus getting employee experience, you know, like, like you need to, to but I, I think also achieving those objectives makes, maybe it's proof, but it also makes you feel like you wanna be on it, you know? Thank you. Being honest. Honest, okay. Fabio. Yeah, in addition to everything that has been said, also accountability without uh, finger pointing. So in a safe environment. Mm, safe, yeah, okay. Alisa. 
<clears throat> I would add to uh, what's been said already that people should be not isolated, only uh, focused on their uh, work, because sometimes collaboration means that a different uh, teams are involved to the process and we have to understand what uh, the needs uh, of other teams. So that's really important. Uh, like developers should understand QAs, QAs developers and not like, okay, I'm coding, you, I'm testing and I don't care what else is working on. So good. Okay, thank you. And Victoria, welcome. Yeah, um, just adding to what everyone else has said, um, my thoughts are what makes a team effective, uh, one that I would want to be in, would be having a good leader, right? A good leader leading that team makes it effective. Um, they can, a team can have very good communications, all the things we've said, but if the, the leadership is not there to drive the team forward and give them that vision, um, yeah, they will not be effective in terms of delivery. That's just my opinion. Okay. Thank you. I have, I have another one, Jane. I, another one I think is um, when you have a team, but everybody has different strengths that come to the table. So it's not everybody is doing the exact same thing, but somebody has, you know, maybe their organizational skills are stronger here, or maybe their creative skills are stronger here, or even, um, just everybody has something, some type of strength that they bring to the table. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Think about teams that you've, that have worked well and thinking about teams that you've been on that did not work well. What, what, what was there something missing that hasn't been mentioned already? I think flexibility. I'm rolling with the punches because you never, depending on the project, you, never, you don't know what's going to come your way. There could be somebody's let go or, you know, that maybe the money has been changed or whatever. So I think rolling with the punches and the flexibility. Um, and I think for myself, teams that have gone kind of awry have kind of, I think sometimes ego, sometimes people... Maybe it's just in nature they they feel like they should be the dominant one, so they might like push other people out. So um, I, sometimes ego. Okay, Brenda. Uh, I think teams that don't work well also have um, members who don't pull their weight. So you know, if you're on a team and some people are doing all the work and others are not doing their fair share, that can create a lot of dissension in the team. Right, because then other people are filling the gap and yeah, I have to pick up the slack, and then there's resentment and right. Okay, Alia, you're on mute. Do you have your hand up? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, teams that don't work together for me have been teams there where individual values and their understanding of things have been very out of sync right um each one is doing their thing you know they they feel that they're contributing to towards that common goal but each one is kind of on their own doing it um so it it comes down to me to values and as my boss always reminds me and and I like what he says it's um you want to be on teams where every, people want to work with you, right? You you want to play together. So, and and as I kind of grow, as I kind of mature within the organization, I, I I feel that is a total, you know, um, success thing that you want to be on teams that want to play with you, kind of thing. And and in theory, you want to play with everyone else on the team as well. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you still have to communicate with some people who don't want to work with you, but at least for your core team, you know, be with people who want to play with. Yeah. So. Okay. Lori. Um, throwing out a big term, psychological safety. Mm -hmm. You know, that people are, are it kind of goes, Ryan was touching on it too, that people are seen and heard and everyone has a chance to talk, although... I heard something like you get a chance to talk, you might not always get a chance to vote. 
you know, but at least everyone is, is acknowledged and seen or feels they can. Like if you don't feel that's the safety part. So the, you feel yeah. safe to, to be able to speak up. Yeah. Yeah. So they, so if they have a dissenting point of view, it's okay to share that they may, they may not agree with the final decision, but they know that their point of view has been heard, taken into account and considered in making the final decision. Yeah. And yeah. And that's, that's you know, something that I think in all aspects of life, you know, whether you're on a team, whether you're calling a, a, to complain, you know, customer service, talk to a customer service rep, people just want to be heard. Mm-hmm. People, people want to be able to express their point of view and have someone acknowledge that they have a valid point of view. They may or may not be able to do anything about it, but understand, you know, to, so that they know that people understand where they're coming from. And I don't know if I heard, heard the word respect yes I think I did or maybe I'd, anyway I think that's I, that's been I think underlying what a lot of people have said if if the, that word didn't come out specifically for me respecting and other members on the team is important um and and that that contributes to you know the safe environment the ability to be heard um leveraging different strengths uh you know if you respect each other then you Everyone will pull their own weight, et cetera. So I think that's that's part of part of it as, as well. Anything else that you think is important? I, I think Alia, did you have your hand up? I did. And I, I was, that? and I had a couple of things, you know, with what Lori was saying, and I think it was Fabio who first started it talking about safety, um, and also Victoria about leadership is a team like a, an effective team in my mind is also one where the leader is not afraid to be vulnerable and say, I can't do something and relies on the strength of the individuals, you know, who are on the team. So, you know, the whole being vulnerable as team members or safety, right? It comes down to the to to safety at the end, but the ability to say, even as the leader, I can't do something or I'm not sure or, you know, um, that kind of like expressing and feeling okay, somewhat feelings that you won't normally say at work. Um, I think that contributes or I believe that contributes to, you know, effective teams. And right. taking an interest in your team members, right? Um it's not just, you know, all work, 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 but also taking an interest in their personal lives and trying to find a way to um, compensate them for like extra work with something they like, right? So. Okay. And, you know, when you mentioned about the leader being vulnerable, so it's, it's, the psychological safety is for the leader as well as for everyone on the team. Yes. Yes, for it's sure. Safe. It's safe yeah. for the leader as well as safe for everyone. And that can be a really good role modeling of the leader role modeling, whatever vulnerability it is. And, you know, but there's also, you know, leaders, there is a fine line because you can, sometimes leaders can overshare because they need to balance that with, okay, but yeah. I've got this right? Like, you know, or we've got this, in, right. in my personal opinion. So um, there needs to be a bit of a balance. But uh, yeah, definitely, you know, it, it does come down to to the leader. Anything else? Any Jane, I, I want to add on to when you had talked about respect, because I think respect is something you don't have to like somebody in order to respect them. You might respect their strengths. You might respect some of their decisions. Um, they might not be, you know, somebody who you're going to hang out with after work that you don't like them in, in that aspect, but you have to be able to kind of get yourself working towards that common, common goal that, that you all have. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. I've, I mean, I've had plenty of people who I, I did not want to socialize with, but, but I was very happy working with them. Right. I respected yeah respected them their contribution we were able to work together um it's it can be more fun if you like everybody 
but it's but it's not a not a prerequisite as long as you've got the yeah. respect and and a foundation. Um, what about trust? I don't think anyone said the word trust. I think it goes without saying. <laughs> okay, I guess. I... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, if you don't trust the people you're working with, should you be working with those people? Excellent question. Yeah. Yeah. I still think that uh, it could be an issue the trust because sometimes you don't feel that you trust you can share your opinion you can be honest uh, fully about the process and you can be in silo so it's not like you 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 don't believe that someone is like understand what's doing but you you don't trust to share something as well and uh, yeah I sometimes it, it creates silos. Yeah, it, it definitely can. Okay. I wonder if trust, I guess it's like the winning too though. Is trust an outcome or a or a prerequisite? Excellent question. Le excellent question, Lori. Let's um let's talk about that a bit more as we as we go forward. Uh so thank you everyone. I've I've taken notes because there's some really good things here I you you might see this might see this on a uh, LinkedIn post <laughs> in the in the future um, unless Kelly beats me to it and, and uh, issues something first but anyway um, really really good stuff and I, I yeah I think you know clearly everyone here has been on teams and has seen what can help make a team work so Last week, Pete talked about the brain being a social animal and safety and how feeling connected to others is really fundamental to us as human beings. We need to feel connected. When we feel connected, there's a sense of related, relatedness, which you get when you're part of a group. A group mm -hmm. you know, is, is a team. So when you're part of a team, that can feed a really basic fundamental need that human beings have. And this is, you know, Pete talks a lot about there's primary rewards and there's threats and toward responses and away responses if, you, you know, if you've been going to his sessions. So this relatedness is something that we are going to want to move towards. We are going to seek it out. We like to be on teams that are working well, particularly where we feel like we belong. Pete also talked about how we decide if someone is a friend or a foe. And that leads to either the towards response, if we see them as a friend, or an away response, if we think they're a foe. So, you know, if we think teammates are foes, we're going to want to move away. We're not going to want to work with them. You know, if they're not aligned with the vision, if they're not doing all the good things, if we don't trust them, if we don't respect them, then we're not going to work with them very well. And the team is not going to be very effective. If they're perceived as friends, that doesn't mean friends in the context of you know, we, we, we tell them all our personal secrets, um, but if they're friends in, the, in a work environment, if they're work friends, you know, we're gonna move towards them. We're gonna work mm -hmm. with them. We're gonna make the effort to connect more and, and accomplish the objective that we need to accomplish. So how do you build an effective team at work? Pete also referred to this. Many of you have probably heard of, uh, typically talk about the four stages of team development, forming, storming, norming, and performing. A fifth one that doesn't always get talked about, um, but at some point teams come to an end, there's a, a termination. And so what happens when, you know, we think about this, um, this particular model, when a team is in the forming stage, the members are excited about, oh, we get to work together. They might also be a bit anxious. Is this going to work? You know, am I going to get what I need? Is it going to be too much work? Can I fit this in? So there can be some mixed feelings, both positive and less positive. The behaviors that the team will be exhibiting primarily, they're questioning, they're understanding what's our purpose, objective. They wanna know what their role is and they wanna make sure that they know what they need to do in order to move forward. So in the forming stage, the team is creating structure, the goals, the direction, the roles. This is where you can start to build trust in the group. You know, in theory, there should be a kickoff uh, to establish what the product or the outcome is of the team. We need to deliver X. Uh, and what is the process that's going to be used to deliver that? And there may not be a lot of tasks accomplished in terms of accomplishing that product. You know, if you're, you're building software, you may not actually 
write any code yet in the forming stage because you're sorting out the other pieces of it. And this is where a leader is really important to making sure these steps uh, get all this gets set up properly. Then the team moves it moves into the storming stage. They might be feeling some frustration. It's like, oh, I didn't know I was going to have to do that, or I'm not sure I'm aligned. I don't understand. So they might start to be feeling, and they might express some of that uh, frustration. They might argue with other team members. So this is where some of the you know the, the, the negativity might be coming out because. I might think that, well, I should do that. And Alia thinks that she should be doing the same thing. And we need to sort that out. We might sort it out in a friendly way or in a less friendly way. Again, the leader can help by defining and in terms of tasks, redefining and refocusing. So in the storming stage, this is when the team can, things might shift a little and, and it might feel awkward and unpleasant, but it's an important stage for the team to go through because the roles, the tasks, the goals, everything gets redefined and, and really locked down. The team will develop the skills they need if they don't already have them. They'll be figuring out how the team's gonna to work together. Um, and they'll learn better conflict management skills because there's going to be some conflict. After the storming stage, you move to norming. So people are feeling comfortable. We've sorted out some of the questions we had. We're feeling like part of a team. We're starting to feel excited again that, oh yeah, we can do this, we've got this. So communication will increase, collaboration will increase and focus on the tasks. Put your head down, get the work done is what happens in the norming stage. You're focused on the team goals, productivity increases. Then when you get to the performing stage, this is when the most best stuff happens really as you get the team is satisfied with the work they're doing. So they feel personal satisfaction for their contribution. There's a real attachment to the team, attachment to the goals and objectives, and they have confidence that they can do this. They're going to assist each other. They're going to work together. They're going to say, hey, you know, Kelly's gotten overwhelmed with some other stuff that's happening. She can't quite deliver her piece on this team. I'm going to pitch in. Hey, Kelly, what can I do to help? So this is when the team is really working as a, a strongly well-functioning unit, doing all of the things that we we talked about and, and all of the great ideas that everyone shared. So this is when goals get accomplished. The team, you know, um, the team is really working on the team as well as the work that needs to be done. And this is when the team starts to celebrate. Hey, we, you know, we, we passed milestones one and two, now passed milestone three. And you start to have celebrations as you're moving forward. And at any point, as new people enter a team or when people leave and things change, you might have to go back to the forming stage or you might go to storming. So there can be a cycle in here as a team evolves, as you, you know, you might finish one set of objectives and now you have new objectives. So there might be going back to the forming and okay, now, now what is the new direction? What are the new goals? If it's an existing team, you're gonna move more quickly through the stages if you've already been working together. But anytime there's something significant new injected into the team, there's going to be a little bit, a little bit of a, a loop. Many teams work together for many, many years, but at some point teams, generally they, they will end. As the end of a team is like, okay, we've accomplished all this great work and now the team is being disbanded. disbanded. People start to feel anxious. Well, I'm, I'm gonna miss the people. There's, there can be some sadness. There can also be satisfaction that we did an awesome job and being really happy for the contribution they made. So again, some mixed emotions as the team ends. Some people will become less focused because they're feeling badly that the team is, is, is going to be disbanded. Some will become more focused on the tasks at hand because they wanna get everything done and do the best work possible. And the tasks, it's completing the deliverables, it's really good. Not every team does this, but they should then evaluate how did the team work? What did we learn about how we work together as individuals, how we work together as a team, the process we used, the decision making systems we used to be able to feed that back into the system so that the next team can learn from that learning and the next team can perform even better. And then when a team ends, ideally, you celebrate the accomplishments of the team and you formally close out the team. Um, the, the reference for this chart I've, I've got on the slide, you'll get the slides after, um, I'll send them to Kelly, she'll send them out to everyone. 
Um, so you can look up and, and, and do more reading on this. But this is this this theory has been around. I think it was 1965 uh, when this was was first outlined, and and people still talk about it because it still makes sense. It's still a very logical um, uh, way to to help teams teams build. Another way to think about teams is um, you might have read or heard of the book The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni, and he outlines in this book how he's got this little pyramid of the five things that can go wrong with teams. And it's kind of like a Maslow's hierarchy, right? There's, you know, at the base, you have to start, it says, if there's an absence of trust, the team, it will be dysfunctional. That can lead to a fear of conflict. So uh, someone mentioned, you know, that Laura, you mentioned psychological safety and a couple of other people had mentioned being willing to share your points of view. If you're afraid of conflict, you may not share your point of view. Again, the team then may be dysfunctional and may not come to the best um, result, may not meet the objective. When there's no trust and a fear of conflict, there's not, there's, there's not gonna be commitment to the team. It's like, yeah, okay, I'll go and I'll, I'll kind of do what I need to do. I'm not gonna go above and beyond. I'm not gonna help out when, when Kelly can't deliver because she's now been given seven other priorities, right? Um, I'm not going to help Kelly out. So the commitment can, can weaken. Avoidance of accountability. I think Fabio mentioned accountability being important to a team. If you don't have commitment, you're not going to hold your teammates accountable. You're not going to say, hey, you know, so-and-so, you didn't do this. Can, can, I, can, I, can we talk about how can we help you do this? You know, this needs to be done. And, and if people aren't doing that, the team's not meeting its objective and ultimately inattention to results and, and not delivering the results can happen. And it comes down fundamentally, there's an absence of trust. I was at a conference last week, we had a speaker in who talked for two hours on trust. Um, and it, I've, I've got the book and now I have to read the book. <laughs> and there are so many, many things that individuals, leaders, organizations can do to build that trust because that is the, the most important foundation. So maybe we'll do a session on trust someday, Kelly. Um, but that's the, the foundation. So then of course, the opposite side of this is what are the five functions of a team? When a team is functioning, they trust one another. They engage in unfiltered conflict around ideas. So there's, it's, I'm, I'm you know, I'm totally comfortable to say, I, I don't see that quite the same way you do. I believe, I think, I, you know, I understand this. And share it. And then you have an open discussion with no hard feelings. But you need the trust <clears throat> and the psychological safety in order to do that. And then you can commit to the decisions and the action plans. You can say, yeah, I'm going to go do this work, right? I can do this. And you jump in and do it. You hold each other accountable. You support each other if people need help and you focus on the achievement of the team results. You, the leader, everyone understands these are the goals. This is the overarching objective we have. This is the work that needs to be done. This is my, how my piece of the work fits in. This is how I need to communicate and connect and collaborate with everyone on the team because we are all aligned that we need to and we want to accomplish the objective. Any questions on, on any of that? No, okay. Pete also talked about, so part of this is moving from foe to friend. Pete, Pete said that um, humans, you know, the brain is wired so that you go in, the, the assumption is that people are foes because that in, you know, caveman time, times, that was the safer approach. Assume they are an enemy, not a friend. And then over time you figure out if they're if they're friendly. So we are wired to predispose to be predisposed that they're not going to be a friend. So how do we make them friends? And Pete talked about having conversations, talk about the weather, talk about the traffic, having a handshake in a you know, business meeting when you first meet someone, exchanging names and cards, having any kind of conversation starts to build those those connections, the, the mirror neurons, and you start to shift that person's your perspective to them to being a friend. And, and I've added, have fun together. So um, so often 
teams, they will, they'll spend a day together talking, you know, um, talking about the objectives, doing, you know, they might have training, they, they spend time doing the professional stuff. And then they go out for dinner, or they might go bowling, or they might do, you know, a, a ropes, high ropes, rock climbing, something. They do something fun together. And those activities are really important to shift your perspective of everyone in the group from foe to friend. Breaking bread together is so important. And so even if it's virtual, um, I think I might've mentioned this last, last um, time, but even having a virtual lunch where it's not a team meeting where you're gonna talk about work, but just having a meal together where you get to know each other socially moves everyone into the friend category. And that is important. This is work friend, right? And some may lead to personal friends, but that is so important to making the team work. And those shared experiences are important. Pete also pointed out, but it ultimately comes down to having shared goals. So through that exercise, it comes down to everyone's aligned. This is the objective of the team. We need to, we're building something, we're creating something, we're solving a problem and having everyone aligned to that goal. So when I look at criteria for effective teams, I, I really, I simplify it to three criteria. They need to define what work needs to get done, how the work needs to get done, and how the team works together so the work can get done. And so what work gets done, this is all about direction, leadership and decision-making. And you will get these slides, so don't worry about madly trying to take notes. Direction setting, what are the objectives? Are the team's objectives, how do they align with the company objectives? So your team will have an overarching objective, but that has to fit into the broader company objectives. How do those uh, stack up and line up? So they need to be known, are they measurable? People need to understand, how will I know I accomplish this goal? So they need metrics. Leadership can provide accountability, get the resources that are needed. If you find you need more money, you need more people, it's the leader's job to figure out how to get those resources. Removing barriers, you need a decision made more quickly and there are barriers in getting a decision made. The leader needs to work through that. And the leader will often make decisions, but quite often in a team, especially if it's a large team, there will be some um, sub leaders who will be making decisions. And so for the leader and for the team to truly understand who owns dis which decisions so that they can just keep moving. I can make this decision. I move forward. You're going to make that decision. So when you make it, we move forward and some need to be made by the leader. Okay. So decisions are sometimes also delegated up outside of the team, depending on what, what uh, the, the decision is. So Figure out what work needs to get done, takes direction, leadership, and decision making. The second one is how does the work get done? So this is all about roles and systems. Roles, having the right people in the right job. So the right people doing the right work. Kelly, you talked about diversity, different, different skill sets. So making sure if you need a creative person, you have a creative person. You know, you, you need someone who is going to be... Um, very task focused and, and keep you on track, manage, you know, manage the critical path, the project manager. You need someone with those skills. Uh, different communication styles. Anyone who's been on, on any of my talks before about effective communication, and there are dominant styles, influencing styles, steadiness styles, and compliance styles. Different styles, different ways of thinking, different behaviors. You want to have all of those on a team because that is ultimately how you're going to move forward. And you know, making sure that everyone has a chance to contribute at their best and be engaged. And that's by being in the right role and being able to contribute to their best. Systems, to get the work done, you need systems and processes, right? So under establishing the systems and making sure everyone understands what, what systems and processes are going to be used, whether it's for making decisions, for problem solving, how our priority is going to be defined, just, you know, the, the logistics of how the work gets done. I do piece A, I then pass it to Kelly. Kelly does her piece. Kelly passes it to Alia. Alia passes it to Lori. This is the order you're in on my screen. So that's it, right? So, so, 
you know, and then Lori might send it back to me, whatever, but understanding that and what everyone's piece of the, the puzzle is measuring your progress and knowing, are you on track, off track with different pieces? So if you're off track, that collaboration comes back in and everyone pitches in. How do we get back on track? What do we do about this? Reward and recognition, right? That's a system. That's a, that's a process. When you do a great job, make sure everyone knows that someone's done a great job and that they've moved things forward. And running efficient meetings. Um, I spent an hour in a peer group year, <laughs> last year sometime talking just about how to run e effective and, and efficient meetings because otherwise people will get frustrated and like, oh, I wasted another hour, right? So that's, we've talked about the work, figuring out what the work is. This is how the work gets done, how the team works together, relationships and communication. The very first point made when I said, what makes an effective communication or effective team? Kelly talked about good communication and communication came through in so many things that people said. So what are the relationships? Do the work to move people from foe to friend so that you are developing strong, positive relationships. Doesn't mean you need to absolutely really love them and necessarily like them, but you need to respect them and value them as individuals. Onboard them properly. So partway through team, you might get a new member. Remember that brings you a little bit back to the forming stage, but onboard them. Make sure they know everyone on the team. Make sure they understand how the team works, that they understand the processes and systems, have standards for the team. So someone mentioned um, values and you know some specific values were named like being polite, et cetera. So what are the values for your team? Respect, diversity, meeting commitments, supporting each other. Make sure you've defined those. Uh, thanks, Samantha, have a good day. <laughs> um, so define those values for the team, define the fundamental operating principles. And these generally will mirror the values and, and the vision uh, that the company has. So I'm, you know, I'm talking in a business environment that this can apply to volunteer work or anything, mm -hmm. but generally a team will be a subset. And so the team's values will mirror the company values, but the team might decide that they want to shift those a little bit because for the team to accomplish what they need, they might shift those values a bit. There might be something that they want to add to the list. And so effective communication, it's kind of everything we've talked about. It's those different styles, making sure you're communicating in a timely manner, the right communication at the right time, enough communication, but not so much that people get overwhelmed with things they don't need to know, um, giving constructive feedback in the team. So for the leader to be comfortable and other team members to be comfortable to share, this comes back to, you know, can I share a, a different point of view to be able to say, to take someone aside and say, hey, can we talk about something? You know, can we talk about a particular situation and, and being able to provide feedback, good constructive feedback, not just, I didn't like what you did, right? It, it needs to, it needs to be, um, again, feedback, that's another whole <laughs> few hours. Um, but these are the things that can really help make a team effective. So it was, what is the work to be done? How is the work going to be done? Um, and yeah, how the, how the team works, works together. So think about a team you're on and think about how you can make your team more effective. You don't have to be the leader to contribute to the effective running of a team. Do you need people with overt roles for the, you know, some of the different things we've talked about? Who should the people be? Do you need to define, does there need to be someone on the team who always makes sure you stay on track <coughs> on the agenda? That might be one person. There might be one, <coughs> excuse me. There might be rotating role for taking minutes, whatever. How do you onboard new members? Do you refresh your team norms regularly? You know, if you've agreed you have certain systems processes, do you go back every now and then and say, are these still working? Maybe we need to adjust this because some things have changed. I think Ryan talked about uh, flexibility. You know, things can, things can change. They will change when a team is working together. So that might mean you need to change how the team works together. So having some regular checkpoints on your team. So think about how you can make your team more effective and the last things I just want to remind from the productive meeting session I did, 
the five P's of productive meetings, because if you can't have... <coughs> Excuse me. If you can't have productive meetings, the team is probably not going to be very productive. So knowing the purpose of, the, of any meeting you have, whether you're the leader or the participant, why on earth are you having the meeting? You know, what is the plan is, what is the agenda? People should have an agenda before a meeting. If you haven't received an agenda, ask for the agenda to make sure you know what's gonna happen at the meeting. Having the right people at the meeting. So all of the people you need, but only the people you need. And if you're invited to a meeting, it's like, I really don't need to go, then say that to the leader. Say, you know, I really, I don't think I'm, I'm not critical to this meeting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on my objectives um, and make sure they're okay with you not being there. Process, you know, start and stop on time, follow the agenda, uh, keep things on track and participate. So the leader invite input from everyone, but also control the discussion so you don't get totally off track. And as a participant, speak up. If the team is working well, you will be comfortable speaking up, even if you are extremely introverted or shy, right? If the team's working well, you'll feel comfortable raising your hand. And if the leader thinks there's someone who's not comfortable raising the hand, then the leader needs to figure out how to help that person be comfortable speaking up because everyone has good ideas to contribute to, uh, to, the, to the meeting, to, the, to the, the objectives of the team, okay? Before we open up for questions and discussion in May, now I have the wrong date, apparently it's now Wednesday, May 10th. Uh, Pete's going to talk about fairness and status. So people like fairness. They want a sense of fair play. He's going to talk about what that means, you know, from a brain perspective um, and how people think about status and the importance of status. And then I will take that into integrity and humility at work. So Fairness and status, part of that leads into integrity and you know, how, how, can you, how can you be humble? How can you um, have the status that you want, but in, in, in an appropriate way <laughs> um, at work because all of these things also contribute to effective running of a team and accomplishing your objectives. All right, I will stop share.